1 Samuel 17. Since we've been talking about giants this weekend, we'll talk about the one that everybody knows about. And um, I appreciate that amazing grace, how sweet the sound, because I was thinking about that when I was thinking about the, the message and about David, about Goliath, and this story. And I've heard a lot of sermons on this and, and taught a few things myself, but I've heard a lot of sermons on this and sermons like encouraging us to be David against the giant and everybody, everybody needs to be a David. You need to be a David and stand up and everybody should be like David. Let me kind of give you my spin on this chapter. I think it's fine to try to be like David, but I'm not David and I'm not like him. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm more like the Israelite army that sits on the sidelines and doesn't go into battle against Goliath because I know that I'm not going to win. I know that. And I've faced my giants. I've faced things that I didn't want to face in my life. And God made me deal with it. But God made me realize that I'm not Jesus and I can't defeat him on my own. So why did God send David into this battle when all the armies of the Israelites were there. And the truth of it is, God wanted one man to represent his people. And that one man, of course, is Jesus Christ. And we're just along for the ride. Amen? It's about what Jesus does and what Jesus can do. And it's not necessarily about what we do or what we can do. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle... And we're gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah. And I want you to underline that or think about that for a minute. Because the Philistines are in a place that does not belong to them. And I've preached on that many times. And about how we allow things in our lives that do not belong there. We allow sins. We allow habits. We allow the world into our lives. The world does not belong in our lives. We're supposed to be separate from the world. In fact, there's something I want to draw your attention to here in a little bit. But anyway, that belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Ezekiah, and Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain. I want you to look at verse 3 now. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And I want you to look at verse 16. And uh, I don't know if God's going to let me preach that part or not, but verse 16, the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. How many of you remember from yesterday, we talked about 40 days? Okay, that comes up often in the Bible. In fact, I did a little search on it. 22 times in the Bible, you'll find the phrase 40 days. And what I want you to do is I want you to study that out. And I want you to look at how, what God is trying to tell you about that 40 days. It's significant. It means something because you see it coming over and over in the Bible. In the book of, book of uh, Genesis, you see it with Noah. 40 days and 40 nights it rained. And Moses was up on Mount Sinai 40 days and 40 nights. Elijah uh, was 40 days in the cave. He had been fed by the ravens. And the Bible said he went in the strength of that meat. For he didn't eat for another 40 days. Then, of course, Jesus was fasting and praying for 40 days in the wilderness. And that's when the devil tempted him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You pray for me this morning that God will uh, clear my head and I can preach the message that God wants me to preach this morning. And uh, appreciate everybody being here. God bless you. We love you. And uh, those of you gathering with us online, we love you too. We thank God for you. And we're going to ask everybody online now that you switch places with the people that are here next year. So instead of about 120 people being here next year, we've got a thousand. Oh, what did I just say, God? <laughs> All right. But that'd be great. Amen. We'd just sit them out in the yard, put a big, big screen TV out there and let everybody, as everybody's going by up and down the road, they're going, what's going on at that church? <laughs> Crazy people. Anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask for your help. I cannot preach today, God. There's too much in my mind, too much going on in my heart. And, um, Lord, just to trying to get the service down right and trying to get everything done. And 
And Lord, my mind's not clear today, so Lord, I need your help to preach. And I pray, dear God, that you would, uh, that you would stand here for me and preach to these people. I love them dearly. I love them all very much. Lord, the visitors that have come and the Bethel people here, I thank you for them. And I pray, dear God, that you would continue to bless them and use them for your kingdom's sake and your glory's sake. Father, I love this church and love the people in it. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would have your way in their lives. Lord, not my way, but God, that you would have your way in their lives. Father, they would be obedient to you. They would be submissive to you. Father, they would open up their minds and their hearts to the, to the Word of God and to what you would have them to do. And Father, help us to rest and be content, Lord, in the things that you bring our way and the things, Lord, of life that you bring us through. Help us, dear God, give us understanding of how things really are in this world. That, Father, the battles that we fight and the things that we endure and the trials and temptations that we go through, Father, it's not our strength that got us through. It's not our willpower. It's not our dedication. It's not our faith, God, that got us through. Lord, it was Jesus Christ that brought us through no matter what. He's the one that deserves the glory and the credit and the honor and the praise. And to Him and to the Word of God, Lord, we lift up and magnify this morning. Now, Father, I pray, God, that you would just open up our hearts. And Lord, again, I ask you, God, to help me preach this morning. Help me to preach in love. Help me to preach without apology. Help me to preach, Lord, as if this is the last message that I'd ever preach or that it would be the last message anybody would ever hear today. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that the words would ring true in their heart and in their lives. Father, we pray, Lord, your blessings on these that have traveled many, many miles. We pray, dear God, that you would go with them, Lord, and, and visit with them. And uh, Lord, as they leave this place, God, they could leave, Father, with the joy of the fellowship of this weekend, the joy of, of, of gleaning from your word this weekend, the joy of just being in the presence of God and in the presence of God's people. Lord, they would talk about it, Lord, as they go on their way. And Lord, that you would give them traveling mercy, traveling safety, and back to their homes and give them rest, Father, when this is all said and done. Father, we just pray, dear God, that you'd help me to preach today. Lord, I keep asking that. God, I just need your help today. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen. Well, we know the story. If we look down a little bit there in verse 7, the Bible says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. We learned yesterday that the only place left for the giants to live in was in the land of the Philistines. Now, I want you to understand about the Philistines. Philistines were always the enemies of the Israelites. They were always the sworn enemies of God's people. Israel never got along with, with the Philistines. The Philistines never got along with Israel, and it was a constant battle. If you look through the book of uh, Judges, look through the book of Joshua, you see it in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. Every time the Philistines got an itch, they went after Israel, and Israel had to fight them off, except for in the days of Solomon. But we see Goliath there, and the giants, the only place they're allowed to live now is in Gath and Ashdod, and I can't remember, uh, Ashkelon, I think, is the other name of the city, the Philistine city where they were lived. So Goliath, he may not have been a Philistine, he was a giant, but he was among those who were the Philistines. Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. Now, if you don't believe the Bible, you have an issue with that. You think, well, maybe the Bible just means he was kind of a big, mean machine. No, I believe the Bible says he was, it was right when it says that he was six cubits, and a span, that measures out to be what, about nine, nine and a half feet, something like that. If you had to stand in front of this guy, you would fold up like a house of cards. You'd never make it. You'd real, in fact, you would probably sit there and be like the armies of Israel. You'd sit there in your place and say, I'm not going out there. There's no way in the world I'm going out there. And we read there in verse 16 that Goliath came out every day for 40 days and he cursed God. And he defied the armies of the Israelites. And he said, I'll give me a man that I can fight him. Give me a man. Send somebody out. And he did this for 40 days. What is the significance of the 40 days? Well, at the end of the 40 days, 
God was going to reveal who the real boss was, who the real head was, who the real champion was, who the real king of kings and lord and lord, lord of lords was. We see that in the days of Noah, that after 40 days of rain and 40 nights of rain, God showed to the world that he meant what he said, that he was real, and those people had to suffer the wrath of a God that they no longer believed in. I believe, Mo I believe Noah preached for 120 years the coming of the Lord and the coming of that flood and gave the invitation to everybody that wanted to that that would listen to him that they he could they could be invited into the ark that they could be saved from God's wrath and nobody listened to it at the end of 40 days I guarantee you people were going we should have listened we should have listened at the end of 40 days Goliath and the Philistines think they've got it made. They think, well, nobody's going to come out. Nobody's going to fight us. We're, we're just going to win and we're just going to march all over them. And God revealed the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords through David, through the, the youngest and the shortest one of them all. God revealed who was boss and who was king. In fact, there is a phrase here, and I got it in my notes somewhere. In, uh, if you look in verse 46... Uh, David said, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. I just like David's cockiness. Amen. Goliath, look in my eyes. Do you see anybody here that's afraid of you? Goliath, listen to me. The Lord is going to deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth. And I want you to look at this. And I want you to focus upon this, what David said right here. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. I want all of Festus, Missouri to know, even if they don't like this church, even if they despise me, they want nothing to do with it, that I want the world to know that there is a God in Bethel Church. And that God loves us. Christ died for us. We're saved by His grace. We ain't nothing but a bunch of manure piles out there. And God saved us. And we're going to heaven one of these days. And there's a God in Bethel Church. I would like for the world, I would like for Festus, Missouri to know that. I'd like for Jefferson County to know that. I'd like for the state of Missouri, the United States to know that. And I would like for the world to know that there is, in fact, a God here amongst the Isle of Misfit Toys. Right here in Bethel Church, we're messed up people. We've got problems. We've got sins that we're trying to conquer. We've got issues in our life. We've got baggage that we've been carrying around for years, don't know how to set it down. And there is a God here in Bethel Church. And I want to tell you something. If you want God to do anything in your life, make sure that you've got Him first and you last in it. And so that anything that you want God to do in your life, that you've got it in your mind and your heart, that it's because you want the world to know that there is a God in your life and he's in control. Somebody say amen. amen. Moses went up on Mount Sinai and he was up there for 40 days and for 40 nights. Didn't eat a thing, did not drink a thing. He was up there for 40 days and for 40 nights. And then God revealed himself to the people of Israel through, watch this, the book. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of the law in his hand, written by the finger of God, written on the front side and on the back side. That's just like the book in Revelation chapter 5 where God's got a book in his right hand, sealed with seven seals, written on the front side, written on the back side. That means you're not going to add anything to it. You're not going to take anything away from it because it's written in stone. Amen. And, the God, and God revealed himself. Jesus, Jesus fasted for 40 days. And 40 nights in the wilderness did not eat anything while he was out there in the wilderness. His body was weak. He was tired. He was a hungered. Satan came to him, thought, I got him now. He's in the weakness of his flesh. I'll roll right over him. I'll get him to turn those, that stone into bread. I'll get him to eat that thing. I'll get him to tempt God. I'll get him to jump down off of here. Surely I'll get him to bow down to me. And Jesus quoted scripture, quoted scripture, quoted scripture. It is written, it is written, it is written. And run the devil off so that everybody would know that there was a God in the midst of Israel. And that God was Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. Boy, I'm tired now. That's a lot of preaching for amen. just a few minutes. Let me back up here for a minute. Let me give you this part here. 
I want you to notice in verse 3, the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other. And there was a valley between them. Even the Philistines recognized that they were not the Jews. The Jews recognized that they were not the Philistines. So the Philistines got on one side and the Jews got on the other. And there was a valley between them. When the rich man died... And when, he, when his eyes lifted up and he realized that he was in hell. He asked Father Abraham, who he could see across the way. He said, will you send Lazarus and dip his water, his finger in water and come over here and cool my tongue for I'm tormenting this flame. And Abraham said, he cannot. For between you and I, there is a great gulf fixed. So that everybody on your side cannot come over here. And everybody on our side cannot go over there. They are separate one from another. And I love you. And I may be your pastor. And you may be sitting here from Sunday to Sunday. But I want you to know that at some point, you're going to have to figure out whose side you're going to be on. We've got churches, all, in fact, that, that's the way of the church nowadays. The church wants to play down in the valley with the Philistines. The church wants to make it like, let's, well, in fact, let's go, over to the, let's go over where the Philistines are. Let's go over there and see how the Philistines are dressed. Let's dress like the Philistines. Let's, let's have our ladies and our young daughters pull their britches legs up and show, show everything they've got, unbutton their shirt a little bit and pull up their shirt a little bit and show their body off because that's how the world does it. And so if we go over there dressed like the world, then maybe they will want what we've got. Well, listen, if you go over there acting like the world, dressing like the world, talking like the world, being like the world, you ain't got nothing, amen, that they want. There may be somebody over on the other side that dresses like that, that talks like that, that, that lives like the world that doesn't want to live that way anymore. And maybe they're looking for somebody that doesn't live that way. Somebody that doesn't talk like the world. Somebody that doesn't sing the world's songs and watch the world's junk. Maybe they're looking for somebody that God has cleaned up their life and given them a life worth living. Maybe that's what they want out of that. And I'm just telling you, at some point, you're going to have to decide who said, you're going to be on the Philistine side, then get over on the Philistine side. You're going to be on God's side, then get over on God's side. Because what I'm seeing in this world right now, and this is where we are, this is really where we are. The valley's full of people. But what's happening is, because sin is becoming more sinful, and the world is becoming more and more worldly, there's the people who say they identify with God's people. The world wants nothing to do with those who really believe God's word and live it. Am I right? Because a lot of you have been forced out of situations or family or company or work environments or wherever it is you have been. It's not that they were nice to you, but they talked about you. They forced you out. They said, get out of here. We don't want you around here. If you're going to, if you're going to pray and if you're going to read your Bible like that and bring the Bible up every time you talk. And if that's how you're going to, if you don't want to drink with us, you don't want to take our pills with us. You don't want to, you don't want to smoke with us. You don't want to do these things with us. Then why don't you go over there where you're happy? And I'll tell you what, you ought to be glad to leave them. Somebody say, amen. You ought to be glad to get away from there. They don't want you around. Amen. So at some point, all the people down there in the valley that are supposed to identify with God in his people, you're either going to have, you're going to have to get it settled whose side you're going to be on. Because the Philistines don't want the, the saints around. The saints, God has called, called us. You t t turn your Bible to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Turn your Bibles there. I'm not going to put it up on the screen. Because I don't have it on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 15. What concord hath Christ with Belial? You know what that means? Christ is on one mountain and Belial is on the other. Even when. 
Even when the devil came to Jesus to tempt him after 40 days in the wilderness, even when the devil came to him to tempt him there, after Jesus started quoting scripture and he quoted scripture and he quoted scripture, you know where the devil went? Left him. Back over on the other side with the Philistines. Do you know why? The devil can't handle all that scripture talk. Neither can the world. That's what I just said. They're tired of you praying. They're tired of your scripture talk. They're tired of your lifestyle. They don't want anything to do with you. And they're going to run you out. And some of you, they have run out. It's because they don't want you around. And not even the devil could stand around it. And he left. Now, if you want to move over there with him, I want to encourage you not to. But I can't stop you. And I realized that a long time ago. And every now and then I get reminded of it. I have no power and influence over anybody's life. In fact, I don't want the influence over your life. What I want is for God to change your mind and change your heart and do it through His Word. That way, once it's changed, it's permanent. Amen. There was a big valley between them. Well, where am I going to preach now? I didn't preach a lot of it. Presented himself 40 days. Look down in uh, verse 40. Why well, I like this. First Samuel 17, he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Why the number five? Those of you, you say you've been listening to my stuff. Well, here's your test now. I'm going to find out if you've been really doing it. Huh? Four brothers. He didn't use them on them. He didn't use them. He didn't use those stuff. It, it wasn't David that killed Goliath's four brothers. It was David's mighty men that did that. Why did he pick up five smooth stones? Hold on. Hold, hold. It's not an auction now. Hang on a second. I want you to look in. Look in. Where is it? I probably won't be. Ah, 1 Samuel 17, 52. After David kills Goliath, and the men of Israel and Judah arose, and what they do? Shouted. What is it that we're waiting for? We're waiting for the trumpet to sound, not the Trump, not Donald Trump. We're waiting for the trumpet to sound. We're waiting for the dead in Christ to rise. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a... See, right here in this story, remember that deal about the wheat and the tares? How, you know, when it's not harvest, you can't tell the difference between the wheat and the tares. They're both green. Harvest is a transformation, is it not? And at harvest time, then it was very clear who was on God's side and who was on the world's side. See, that was the point I was trying to make a while ago about they was over here on this mountain and they was over here on this mountain. This is in relation to a time of transformation when there is coming a time, my friend, when it is going to be very, very clear who's right and who's wrong. Who's a sheep and who's a goat. And there are many people playing church everywhere. Do you guys see it? These guys go around and I, I guarantee you they see churches that are playing the game and are not right with God. Because they had good upbringing. Right? Your mom and daddy raised you right. Taught you well. Taught you how to recognize that and taught you how not to be a part of it. Amen? So this is about the time of transformation. And here they are shouting. And here David picks up five stones. And that represents the translation, the rapture. But that's not what I'm going to preach about today. Now I'm going to get into the message. It's quarter after 12. Somebody call downstairs to see if the chicken's still there. Look at verse 48. See, I told you my mind was running all over the place today. So if God does anything today, it'll be God, it won't be me, all right? So I'm going to make a mess of this message. Look at verse 48. 
And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And there's another aspect of this, and I have not put that in my notes here, but you remember Saul tried to give David his armor. He tried to give David his armor, and David said, I cannot do it. I've not tested it. I've not tried it. I've not proved it. It probably didn't even fit. Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. That's how big Saul was. And David was probably just a little ruddy, a little redhead, a little snot. And it just, it just wasn't going to work. And I'm telling you, you can try this in a church or you can try that in a church. You can try programs. You can try all these things. You can try to appease the world, be friends with the world, be nice to the world. And I'm talking about, let's say, let's say you've got lost loved ones that you want to see saved and you've got friends you want to see saved. You can try to be worldly with them. You can try to act like them and talk like them and be like them. And maybe they'll like you. Maybe they'll think you're different than all the other Christians they knew. But the bottom line is you're showing them that you're more like them rather than showing them that you're more like Jesus. And David said, I want nothing to do with it. David went with what he knew. And what you know is the Bible. What you know is prayer. What you know is godly living. So David hasted and he put his hand in his bag, verse 49, and took thence the stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone, stunk in his, the stone sunk in his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a what? With a stone. What is the significance of that stone? Well, if you look back in uh, Exodus chapter, I can't remember, chapter 32 or chapter 34, You'll see Moses come down from Mount Sinai. We mentioned that a while ago. And he's got the two tables where God has written with his finger the Ten Commandments. God gave the first copy of the written word of God, sent it down by Moses' hand. And they were written on what? Stone. Now, let me tell you something. There are Goliaths to face. There are Goliaths to, to defeat in this world. And the only way that they are going to be defeated is by nothing else but the stone. And that stone, at least in this part, represents the Bible, the Word of God. And this is why the devil hates your Bible. He hates your Bible. He does not want you reading your Bible. Does not want you thinking on your Bible. Does not want you meditating on your Bible. In fact, what he wants, he wants to get you Bible believers hooked in a, in a Bible study with a bunch of other people who don't have a King James Bible. They don't have one. They got an NIV. They got a New American Standard. They got a Message Bible. They've got a Revived Standard. They got a Holman Christian Standard. They got every other kind of Bible except the King James. And what they want, what the devil wants, is to get you in with them. So you start abandoning, slowly but surely, one Bible study after another, the King James Version. He wants you to get away from that book because he knows that is the stone that sunk into Goliath's head that brought him down to his knees. Amen. Amen. Now look in, uh, let's go to, uh, oh, let's see here. This, the Daniel 2, 45, the stone covered without hands. But here's what I want to get to. Psalm 118. Psalm 118. This stone that, that David slung through the air, number one, represents the word of God. Number two, it represents there back in Daniel chapter 2, verse 45, the stone that was cut out with, without hands. What does that mean? What is the significance of that? The stone cut out with hands means that man did not make Jesus. Jesus made man. The only way we're going to defeat the devil in our lives and defeat Goliath, the only way Jesus is going to do it in our lives and for us is for us to remember that we are practicing God's religion. God is not practicing ours. Amen. We did not invent God. We did not invent... We've been talking about dragons. We did not invent dragons. We didn't invent the giants. We didn't invent unicorns. We did not invent these things that we read in our Bible that some people say, well, those never existed. We did not invent those. God is the one who came up with that. Amen. Our religion is a religion sent down from heaven, given to us in an undefiled word. This Bible is right in everything that it says. It is undefiled. It is pure. And it is incorruptible. And it's the stone cut out without hands. Secondly, it is the stone, uh, Psalm 118, verse 22, it is the stone which the builders refused. How right am I on that? You folks that are visiting with us today, how many churches did you try looking for a, Bible, for a church that preached the King James Bible? 
two, three, five, thirty in the Bible Belt. They live down in Hotlanta. You think it's hot here? Go down there. Thirty churches looking for a church that preached the authorized version. And hadn't found one yet. Have you? About that big, she said. <laughs> we had some people here yesterday and Friday night from House Springs. And they said, we come from such and such Baptist church. I said, great, who's your pastor? She said, we don't have one. I said, really? She said, we can't find one. We can't find one that'll stick with the King James Bible. So we decided it's better to not have a pastor than it is to have one that's going to use some other Bible in our church. How many churches do you think Southern Rays goes to in a year where they don't hear the King James Version preached? Quite a bit. You see, this Bible really is the stone that the builders rejected. The guys trying to build the churches, they don't want to use this Bible. It's archaic language, and nobody really understands it. But the truth, the truth of it really is, is that they've got a different spirit than the one that's represented in this Bible. And the spirit that's in them does not like this Bible, and they won't even touch it. But it is, Brother George, the stone that the builders rejected but that's the very same stone that stunk it that stunk in stunk in Goliath's head, sunk in his head. It stunk in there for good, didn't it? And by the way, I do I will give you this. David does represent Jesus, but if it's Jesus, then it's the church too. Because after David slung that stone and it sunk. And Goliath's head, Goliath fell on his face to the ground. David went over and jumped on him like that, pulled up Goliath's sword and cut his head off. And here's David standing on top of Goliath. May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 8, 14. He shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And that also applies to the Bible. People, you would be surprised at the number of churches and the number of pastors and the number of people you find. You know them on Facebook. They get offended when you say King James Version. It is an offense to them. They stumble. In fact, over here, where is it? I got it in my notes. I know I do. First Peter chapter 2, look up here. Verse 4, to whom coming as into a living stone. This Bible not only is the Word of God, but it's alive, amen. And it's written in stone, means it cannot be added to, cannot be taken away from. This is the Word of God. It is pure. It is in. You cannot erase what's written in stone. It is a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Whenever the Catholic Church prints in their Bibles a list of forbidden books and puts the King James Version at the top of that list, you know you got the right Bible, amen. It's a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones. Listen, we're not dead. Now, I will say that this weekend there was a little bit of... About as good as we can do. Hey, we tried to keep on time with y'all, okay? You ought to see us over in Kenya. Man, they're dancing... And I'm just standing there. That's it. It's all I got in me. Listen, they will tell you that you're a dead church because you don't get up and dance and you don't get up and throw stuff through the air and you don't get up and wall around the floor. That is not a, that's not a live church. Cut a chicken's head off. What are they going to do? But. The chicken that stands the longest. He's the one that's still alive. Amen. You're alive because God's word lives and abides in you. 
Your spiritual house, a holy priesthood, offer up spiritual sacrifices. You know what that means? It's time to kill some spirits. Acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief corner stone. You know, I've told you this. You know why it's the cornerstone? Because it's cut at 90 degrees, not 91, and not 80, 89 degrees. It's cut at 90 degrees, and it establishes the corner so the walls can be straight. Which means that if that stone, that cornerstone laid is not perfect. If that cornerstone laid is not perfect, that building will never last. Did you hear that? If this stone is not true and perfect and right in everything, then the building will not last. Amen? And I've got it in my mind that when you build your house on this book, it will last. Chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be, here it is, disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed. You see, the disobedient church people are the ones who disallow the perfect cornerstone. They are the ones being disobedient who reject the stone and it's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And it's like I said, you get on Facebook and you start saying, I believe the King James Version Bible and what's gonna, who's going to come out of the woodwork? Everybody that hates that Bible. You'll know who is and who isn't. Because some will say, Amen! And some will say, well, I don't know why you think your Bible's better than my Bible. My Bible, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> they are disobedient and they reject the chief corner stone. And that, my friends, is the stone that defeated Goliath. Amen. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. Now, I'm going to ask you today, when was the last time that God was precious to you? When was the last time that prayer time was precious to you? When was the last time church meeting was precious to you? I told you folks, at Bethel, I did it in tears, I did it shaking, that there are people here at homecoming who would love to sit here every Sunday, and Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And they're just not smart enough to get up and move. I don't know what the deal is, I don't know what their problem is. Aaron, bless your heart. She just got in a car and just, I'm going to Bethel. <laughs> Amen. We would take a church full of errands. So make room in that little bed of yours. Because here they come. Because you guys have actually been through looking for a good church. And couldn't find it. The one you found here is precious to you. Right now, we throw away a lot of food, don't we? When we go downstairs and eat, you know, like something, you throw it away. When there's a famine in the land, even the food you don't like becomes really precious, doesn't it? When's the last time prayer became precious to you? 
When is the last time Bible reading became precious to you? When is the last time church became precious to you? That's the stone that defeats Goliath. No other. No other. So unto you that believe, he is precious. But unto those that be disobedient, you have already rejected the very thing that you said you wanted in your life. You tripped over it looking for satisfaction in your life. You tripped over the stumbling stone and didn't realize that it was right in front of you the whole time. I want you to bow your head. Nobody's, we're not going to have singing, nobody, just stay there. I'm just going to ask you this morning, when is the last time the stone became precious? When's the last time Bible reading was precious to you? More than likely, it was in the midst of a drought. It was in the midst of summer heat. And you were in the wilderness. And then when you found your Bible and read it, it became precious to you once again. That's when it happens. It never happens in the midst of plenty when everything's going well. So I've been praying that if anybody just really needs something from God, that God would send them out into the wilderness for a while. Because when they come back, they would find it. And it would be precious once again. So maybe you're here this morning, and maybe you've been in the wilderness. I hope you have, because it's good for you. It teaches you that life is precious, time is precious, family's precious, your Bible's precious, church is precious, prayer is precious. Everything that you risk losing all of a sudden becomes real precious to you. So with just every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to open up the, the altars here.